just want to cover uh, clinical trial results reporting within so process as we all know um, and have have been working in three years for our investigator initiated trial. Um, there there have been some recent updates and changes to some policies at, at NIH and a little bit of tinkering with the FDA um, laws. Um, so that we thought it was a good idea to review um, in the past we've reviewed the registration requirements. Now we're just going to talk a little bit about the um, clinical trials back out results reporting in the registration. So I just wanted to give a little bit of an overview um, what the requirements are for both FDA and for NIH now, which many of the changes have occurred through these NIH policy changes. Um, how to pre prepare the results report and um, just talk a little bit about the four different reporting modules that, that need to be completed for um, for the registration. Um, I won't go into depth into them. They're very complicated, but I just want to show you what the different modules are and some of these data. Um, and then talk about um, the re re review process by the QA team um, in the that how that process works, and then there are additional resources we have here um, at the Med Center or um, at uh, University Park and at the other campuses. Okay. Health and system process. So Excuse me, Elizabeth. This is Dee up at University Park. We're getting all kinds of feedback and big thumping noises and so on. So, is there any way to do something about the audio, Sarah? If you're there. Yeah, we just moved over closer to the podium, so you should be okay now. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Let me know if it continues. So, um, as far as the FDA um, reporting requirements, this is just a little bit of a refresher because not not a lot changed with the FDA requirements. Um, so, just to update you, for any FDA is the FDA Amendments Act, and that's when. Uh, it was about 10 years ago when all the changes came in requiring that these applicable clinical trials be registered in the clinical trials registry and that results get reported for clinical trials that are registered. So nothing really, there was a little, there was a little fine tuning of that um, law with the last back in, back in September, but um, and it went into effect in, in um, January, but nothing really major has changed as far as the FDA um, or the FDA regulated trials go. So applicable clinical trials of study drugs, biologics, and devices that are approved, licensed, and cleared by the FDA need to be registered in the clinical trials web registry, and results need to be reported um, for those trials that are conducted for those um, applicable trials. Um, when do you have to post results to the registry? Um, within 12 months of the primary completion date, um, which is the final data collection for the primary endpoint, not the study endpoint, but the the, um, that, that uh, primary endpoint only. You may have to go back later and um, update results for the study completion and the um, overall study results, but they really want within, within a year the, that primary um, endpoint reported on. Uh, there is a, a way to get some delayed um, results reporting uh, allowed, but it's mostly for industry uh, manufacturers, um, uh, little, very little, um, Investigator initiated things can get um, can be allowed to delay the results reporting, and it's only under very special uh, limited circumstances. Um, pending publications not considered a good cause for delay. So if the researcher said, "Well, we haven't published yet, so we can just delay and wait till we've published our research," that's not acceptable. You have to be within that the law says within the twelve month period. So. Um, collecting that primary completion date is very important, updating the registry with that, with that date, and then making sure you keep within that time frame. That frame is very important in maintaining compliance with the registry. Um, so now NIH has a new policy, and it requires that clinical trials that are defined by NIH as a clinical trial now have to be registered in Clinical Trials Act of and along with that, all results have to be reported for those trials also. So basically, it's any clinical trial under that definition um, that's funded in whole or in part by NIH, um, and it's to promote, promote the broad um, and responsible uh, dissemination of information uh, from in 
from NIH funded clinical trials. And the time frame is the same as the FDA regulated uh, reporting within 12 months of the primary completion date. Once again, pending publication is not considered a cause for delay. So regardless if you haven't, if you're not ready to publish yet, you still have to report on that primary outcome uh, data. So what's the purpose of re results reporting? Why is this being required now? And it's basically uh, clinical trial transparency. That's, that's the name of the game. Um, it's to enhance awareness and in increase uh, public in access um, to information about the interventions in these clinical trials. Um, the IR IRBs can use this, policymakers um, can use this to see what's already going on out there. Does it make sense that we approve this trial when there are 10 other trials like this going on in the country or the results from um, past trials don't look fruitful, that kind of thing it's, it, you know, can be used for. Um, it also mitigates bias in medical evidence based, such as if a trial's not never published, um, usually for negative, negative results, um, we never know the results of those clinical trials. And so they may be repeated again, and it may be unethical to repeat them again. There may have been a lot of, uns uh, a lot of safety issues with the trial. Um, so you don't want to duplicate unsuccessful uh, trials and efforts of uh, unsuccessful trials. And it also, um, contributes to the ethical obligations for human subjects protection, contributes to the generalizable knowledge, um, one of our goals for um, under the um, under human subjects protection. So, and, and all, all in all to increase public trust in, in research. So uh, to describe how results are reported, there's all tables that need to be completed, data tables within the registry. Um, Tables are constructed and completed by the data providers. So whoever the um, investigator is, who is the responsible party for the research, um, mostly usually it's, it's the uh, PI on the study. Um, those are the people who complete the, the different uh, data tables and provide the results. Um, you have to be cautious not to enter any narrative conclusions. Um, there are columns and rows based on the study arms and the measures that you're measuring. You know, um, have the results that you're measuring. Um, so it gets very complicated and we'll, we'll go into the breakdown of just the different modules. Um, like I said, I won't go into a, a, a lot of detail about that, but just so that it looks familiar to you in case you um, are involved with uh, results reporting. To, re to prepare for results re reporting, um, it's important that when you first initially register a trial that you're pretty accurate in the information you put in that um, registration information because a lot of the uh, fields are populated. You can populate some of the results tables from some of the information that's put in the registry. So if you don't do a good job in registering the trial, it's going to be more difficult for you to um, get the information out in the end when you get the report on, on the trial. So just be mindful of that when, you, when you're initially registering the trial. Um, and uh, there's Populating the detailed description field um, can assist in making sure everything's clear, especially for the quali quality assurance review in the end when they're looking over your, the data that you input. So once again, just really important, making sure you're describing and your arms through your trial and the population. Um, there are different modules and they have different structures and the different reports modules. Um, the system, they try to update the system, the PRS system, it's called the Protocol Registration System. That's the system that you're actually entering all the information in versus the general public registry that you can actually see the trial posted. But, um, so when you're in as a user in the system, uh, you basically can see here that they do update the system frequently and when they make changes, there'll be an indicator there that there's, there's new information and you can click on to see what's new and what changes they've made. They take people's comments into, um, into uh, account for, you know, trying to make it more user friendly. We know it's a little bit cumbersome, a little bit difficult to enter data, especially. So they've been working for the last several years to try to make it more user friendly. So just wanted to point out to you that that's available. So uh, there are multiple um, help, help guides in the, um, in the registry or in the PRS system. And I just listed them here for you so that you can see um, some of the different things, you, some of the mini training you can go through to help you along the way in results reporting, um, the definitions of you know, your data elements, 
and just some little uh, helpful hints and webinars, some of the common mistakes that people make so that you can maybe prevent making those mistakes when you go to enter data. So module one is participant flow. And basically it's a table and really what they want is what's happened to the, the, the patients that were included in the trial. They want you to also include any patients who dropped out um, or were in, excluded from the analysis. Um, and basically that's just, this, this slide basically says the same thing, is that um, if you're looking at the flow of participants through the studies, through the different phases of the studies, and then um, you're accounting for all enrolled participants and looking at what data's been analyzed for those, for those um, individuals. Um, here are some of the data flow elements. Um, starred information, the star categories are the ones that are required to be completed in clinical trials that go. Um, but just some of the data elements that you'll see when you go to complete the, um, this module for results reporting. Important, of course, is the study arm and the grouping. Um, and then the time, time frames. Uh, there's the second base, the second module is, outlines the baseline characteristics, characteristics of your population. So you're looking at demographic and baseline data for your trial population in each arm, um, either the control or the treatment arm. Um, the, the registry mandates that um, age and gender are completed for the population. Everything else is optional, so if you collect other demographics, you can add it or not, but you must put in age and gender. And um, basically, it's, it's uh, the, the arms are populated. Um, and I'll, I'll show you, I'll show you a, an example of how it looks once you um, enter the information for each trial arm and the comparison groups. But um, it accommodates different kinds of data, either continuous or categorical. So um, depending on the type of trial you're doing. Um, you're able to input a lot of different information. So this is the format. This is what it would, what I completed um, the demographics would look like for patients and um, entered in this one trial. It looks like there were three different arms in this trial and they had um, two different age groups that they identified. Um, and then you can see the breakdown for gender. So age and, age and um, gender is there. They also added um, region, uh, which is an optional optional um, addition for this for this trial. But you can see how they, they, they break it down and then they also um, include the, the mean and the standard deviation for each um, the, for the age groups for the, for the subjects and enrollment. Module three is an, the outcomes measures and statistical analysis. This is where it really gets a little bit um, more difficult um, to, to complete some of the information. Um, it's, all, it, it's all depending on how difficult your study is, um, the information that you have to put in for your outcome measures. Um, so there, there are tables of values for the primary and secondary outcome measures for each arm. And you also have to um, include the scientifically um, appropriate statistical um, significance and statistical analysis for um, for all the, all the um, different interventions. So it, um, the module displays the results and the statistical analysis um, for both the pre predefined primary and secondary outcome measures. Um, other outcome measures can be included, but you definitely have to, have to report on the primary and secondary as, um, as being the first. Uh, here's just some of the information that they, um, and how it looks when you're going to enter um, information in the PRS. Um, you have to, and, and some of this information, like I said, is imported in from your registration information, but you should, in, from the title, um, you know, import the information in, but you have to be pretty specific, and that's a lot of the pushback that we get um, from the reviewers' comments are, it's too general, you have be more specific in, in um, the terms that you use to define things. T typically with the time frames, people will say, we're gonna monitor up till the end of the study. Um, that's not specific enough. They want how many weeks, at week 16, we're gonna evaluate how many AEs occurred, something like that. You can't just give a vague, a, a vague um, number. So this is what, um, and then they also wanna know in the end, is, is, is it a safety issue or not? 
issue that the measure that you're um, measuring doesn't have to do with safety uh, in the trial. So that's that's a screenshot of just what it looks like when you go to enter enter some of your results. Um, this is a the public view. Once you once you do enter, you saw on the, in the past slide or the last slide um, what it looks like for you to input the data, and then once this is available and released to the public, this would be what um, what it would look like. So the primary measure is what you're reporting on. That what the, the measure, the title measure would be, they're, they're reporting on the number of grade three to five adverse events um, that are related or definitely possibly related to the um, study drug. Um, and then their description of the measurement, how they're measuring it is by the measure term definitions for grade three to five um, adverse events. And their time frame was at, by uh, day 100. And it was a safety issue because we're looking at eight weeks. So that's basically, um, you know how it would look once you report out, uh, and then they also want the, the population description. And they're basically saying that any subject who was randomized and received at least one dose of drug, um, they would be reporting on that person. <clears throat> then um, the the measured uh, values that they, they they're reporting on, they you, you would list the number of subjects analyzed in each of the treatment groups, and then reporting out the, the, num the specific grade three to five adverse events experiences they're showing here um, that were related or possibly related to this. And so then the table would uh, be, be completed to indicate all those uh, different adverse events that you saw. Um, statistical analysis, these are the different um, methods by which you're analyzing your data. You have to um, be prepared to um, you know, explain you know how your how your analysis was conducted, and it the law does require that you um, that specifically appropriate tests for statistical significance are used. So um, that will would all be data elements that you would also need to complete. Um, the last module then that you'd have to complete is adverse events. Um, Adverse events um, are broken into two different sections, both serious adverse events and AEs that are collected during the course of the study that aren't serious adverse events. Um, you, uh, serious adverse events are separated out. The other adverse events um, are reported in those, I think, 5% or more. So, so events that you see over at least 5% of the time have to be reported. They can be either expected or unexpected, it doesn't matter. Um, the, the important thing to know is that you're not reporting adverse events in real time like you do when you're uh, reporting on a clinical trial, um, collecting the data for clinical trial. You know, um, you're waiting till the very end, you're looking at the final results reporting. So it's not um, an ongoing kind of AE capturing, it's, it's an end, end game kind of thing. Um, this is just the definition of what an adverse event is. Um, very fit. And like I said, they break it into serious or other, would be other, other events that don't meet the serious criteria. And once again, this is just um, the breakdown of what's considered a serious adverse event for reporting in the registry. Um, and then what's in all other events, and usually it's a 5% window um, that they've occurred. <clears throat> This is what it would look like once it's uh, once you enter the results and there it's available for public view. This is the series adverse events screen. Um, it'll show you the percentage of, of um, subjects that were treated in both of the arms, and then you'll see for um, the it's broken down by body type or system type, and then the event underneath the system which it belongs to. So for infections, there were three different um, infections that that there were three different serious adverse events that fell under different types of infections and for the other groups there were just one in each of those categories and then they report out for each one and then the other events same thing same thing would be but these would be things that didn't meet that serious definition so when uh, results after results are reported um, the QA system in the protocol registration system goes into effect. And um, just want to talk a little bit about that because that's where investigators sometimes get held up and it's a back and forth, back and forth of comments, kind of like IRB review sometimes. So um, 
clinicaltrials.gov has a um, QA process. When the data is entered and completed by the um, responsible party, usually the PI or the statistician, um, they enter the information and then they approve and release the record back to the protocol registration system. Once the, once the, the record's released back to the system, it goes through the QA process. So they have QA um, reviewers that look through things and look for consistency, quality of the data. They look for all the different little things that, you know, the abbreviations, the acronyms, that kind of thing, to make this um, reading the results um, easy for the general public. Um, so they focus on logic, um, internal consistency, uh, validity, meaning, meaningfulness of the entries and the formatting. Um, if they re if QA review require, um, requires that there's some attention made, some changes that need to be made, what they'll do is they'll make a comment in the record, and it usually appears in a pink box um, when you re when you get it back. Um, and then they reset it to in progress from completed. Uh, and then you'll get, as the record owner or the responsible party, you'll get a notice from the system saying that there are review comments. Um, when it has, when you first sign into your record, there'll also be a red flag showing that there are reviewer comments. Um, so then from that point on, you have to go back into the system, address whatever the reviewer comments are, make the corrections, and then once again, resubmit it back into back to the protocol review and it goes through the QA process again. This is where the back and forth, sometimes it's not very clear what they're asking you to do. And if you're not good at entering data or you're not used to entering data, that's where uh, investigators tend to get bogged down. Um, once it passes, a record passes the QA, um, then it's released um, for publishing on the, on the site and that's where the public can see. And if you go on to the public registry, uh, there's a tab across the, across the middle of it, and it'll say results report. And it'll also say in the, in the one identifier block that results are reported for that trial. So you can go on and see what the results were. Um, some of the comments that the, that the QA reviewers find all the time, um, in general, you know what, we talked a little bit about acronyms being used, abbreviations being used, spelling errors, formatting errors. They want everything in lay language, because this is, once again, for clarity for the general public. Um, they look for consistency, they look for your recruiting status and the start and stop date, make sure you're within, within the time frame that you should be in for, for um, posting and completing results. Um, for the outcome measures, they, they look for terms such as, if you say safety, they want you to define what you mean by safety, is it a certain adverse event that you're looking at? The tolerability, they want to know exactly what, what does tolerability mean. Um, and then just, just all the different outcome measures, all the different um, data elements that you need to report on, they'll go through and find the comments. But they, and they do have a list on their website of some of the frequent errors that are made and how to report the um, errors. As far as investigator time commitment, when you get into the results reporting um, modules, um, Estimate the, the data that they provide that the, the clinical trials registry provides is they say it's an average of 40 hours of time to put in results for the registry. Now, this can vary based on the complexity of your trial. If you're doing a very uh, complex clinical, you know, FDA clinical trial with a lot of adverse events to report on, um, it may take that full time. If it's an easier trial, maybe not, but that's just their average the time. And that usually shocks people because people think, oh, I'm just gonna go in and put in my results. But just telling people this so that they plan accordingly to have um, somebody who's used to dealing with putting data in tables um, and reporting out um, you know, for manuscripts, preparing manuscripts or a statistician be able to enter your data. It's not gonna be somebody who's not used to doing that because it's gonna be very difficult for that person to do. Um, Investigators should try to factor this in when they're planning for a trial and you know you have a trial that's going to require uh, registration on, on the um, clinicaltrials.gov. Um, factor it into your budget. Um, you can recover some of the costs for, you know, for the NIH funds to cover that. Um, it should be, and the results reporting should be completed by either the PI or the statistician, somebody who's familiar with reporting data um, or manuscript preparation. 
not thinking your research coordinator is going to be able to do it because in most cases the research coordinators don't do those kinds of things. So um, it would be very frustrating to go back and forth and just to, even for the research coordinator to have the time to do that would be difficult. Most cases we tell people to if they have if it's an investigator initiated trial that they usually have a statistician involved that's looking at their statistical analysis and that they should probably try to budget for that uh, statistician to um, complete the results reports within the registry. And I know our public health sciences that do, does do this all the time for um, trials that, um, that they're involved with. So um, they're used to doing, uh, entering some of this information. So just plan on that. Penalties for non-compliance. Um, FDA and NIH will work together to ensure compliance and enforcement um, that they're carried out in a coordinated fashion. So if you have a trial that is both FDA regulated and NIH funded, they'll work together. Um, there's civil, civil or criminal um, judicial actions for prohibited acts. So if you falsify data, put false data in the registry, that is also you can have undergo um, criminal um, actions for that. Uh, for FDA regulated clinical trials, they are subject to civil monetary penalties. And from the time I started this, we've gone up, it used to be 10,000 a day, now it's up to 11, 11, 11 and a half. Um, uh, for all violations, and what will happen is they, they'd say that you were compliant, you'd get that initial bill for that initial violation, and then um, you have 30 days to correct any non compliance with within the system. If you don't do that, then they bill $11,000 per day after that, uh, after that 30 day period. So far, the FDA has not imposed any civil um, penalties to date, but we're very concerned that this is going to start because they know uh, there was a study done a few years ago, two years ago now that shows the non-compliance within the registry, using the registry, especially with results reporting, and it's, it's especially in academia, it's something less than less than 10% of the uh, academic sites are reporting within the required frame. So um, as these, these new laws came into effect and the NIH um, policy came into effect, everybody's pretty much gearing up for this to make sure we go back to our old records, identify what's out of compliance, and try to fix those records because the FDA is going to start um, assessing different records on a case-by-case -case basis. So, um, if you have an NIH-funded study, you uh, risk the loss of your federal funding. Um, so any remaining grant funding or funding for future grants may not be released to the grantee. No one wants that either. As far as at the Med Center and at other Penn State campuses, um, we have our institutions working to provide additional support for researchers, because up until this time, we really didn't have a lot of hands-on support for the registry. Um, the, the institution has two separate organizational accounts, and for any investigators in the room, it's important if you have an account to make sure if you're a Hershey, Hershey investigator that you're registered under the right account, under the MS Hershey MC account. Um, back in the days, years ago, when people would just register because they wanted to put their trials on clinicaltrials.gov, not necessarily mandated to, people usually signed up and they picked Penn State as our institution. So we do have a handful of investigators that have been around for a while that have accounts that are under Penn, main Penn State account and not under the Hershey account. So if you have an account and you want to check to see what the organizations say, and we'll work with, um, I'm currently working with um, the quality management offices uh, up at State College to try to get some of those mis, um, uh, mislabeled uh, accounts moved back over to the Hershey side so that they're not they're not getting the alerts on them if they come to us. So there's a handful of people. We, a few years ago, we did correct a bunch of them, but there, there's a handful of people that still are um, registered under the wrong account. So there are two separate accounts. Um, the Hershey account, and then there's the main Penn State account, and that's used for all investigators at University Park or all the other campuses. And if you have money, if, you're, if you have investigators on both, um, for both campuses, I think we decided it's, wherever the main money is coming to. So if our investigators funded investigator should be um, registered under our, um, trial should be registered under our account. And, and our institution would show up as the sponsor. And remember, we're just talking about investigator initiated research, not these um, sponsored, industry sponsored uh, trials. 
those um, accounts are the responsibility of the form of the coroner or whatever. So they'd be listed as a sponsor. They're responsible for results reporting, for entry, everything like that. So we're just at a site listed um, as, um, so in case uh, subjects wanted to find us uh, or find which sites were um, participating. So we, we don't have any responsibilities to that, to those uh, records, just the ones that are our own research files. Um, we can provide general assistance for a protocol registration system. Um, the administrators here currently, um, it's through my office of quality assurance. I'm currently the only person that's working um, with this. We're in the process of hiring a new coordinator that will soon be named. And um, this person, one of their primary roles will be assisting investigators able to do more hands-on um, helping investigators get um, familiar with the system in case they've never looked at anything before. So we can also, in the past, there used to be a very convoluted um, setup for you to create your account within the, for um, the system. Um, now I can do it in a couple of clicks. So you just call me and I can get you right on and get you an account really easily versus going through this long process. <clears throat> you don't have to enter all the data that we required you to do. So, so that's good. Um, and then all the other um, campuses, the quality management office from the Office of Research Protections up at State College, Katie Bodie Lang and Justin Snyder are the two quality management um, individuals that are working and that are working with the protocol administration there. And basically, this is just saying that the CTSA provided some of these slides for us to use. So that's some. They're very um, involved in uh, processes with clinicaltrials.gov. There is a national task force um, that's been in existence for uh, over a year now, trying to get everybody on board, um, identifying how different programs are assisting investigators to be compliant with the program. Um, John Hopkins just sent out a big um, survey for all the participating people in the task force to try to get data um, to see how these different programs are run, um, how are we supporting our investigators, um, you know, how many FTEs are being devoted, how many trials do you have, what you're actually, you know, our site, we have a number of, of trials registered on clinical trials back there, but we're not a Duke that has thousands. So, you know, it's different just to get an idea of the numbers and the time commitment for staffing. But um, so we're on our way. We're, we're, we're you know, this has been a, around for a while. We really haven't had a lot of internal support in either of the campuses or e any of the campuses, but um, I think we're making headway in, into providing some support. We'll probably be working on doing some education sessions um, and then some more one-on-one -on -one, um, training and assistance of investigators if they need to register a trial. And then if they get caught up in some um, questions for, um, with the uh, quality, quality um, review and they can't figure it out. The registry, they also will help you. You can set up um, conference time to talk to the people for the protocol registration system if you just can't work through a certain thing. So um, they're pretty good about getting back to you and answering your questions, but um, you know, it's a work in progress. I think uh, a lot of our investigators have not gone through the whole final stages of results reporting and I think that's, that's a whole thing that work is with the registry. Um, there's other things that we need to do to um, maintain compliance with the system other than you know, making sure you register when you, when you need to register a trial. The IRB does identify for us in CATS IRB when a trial um, should be registered. For NIH funded trials now, you're going to need to know that right pretty much when your grant goes in. You need to come up with a plan of how you're going to maintain registrations and results reports. So, going to need to know which trials qualify um, at the process of obtaining your permit. So, um, and, and the FDA regulated ones, they're, they're almost pretty easy. You can kind of figure out if you're using an FDA regulated product. So, so anyway, there, there's going to be more assistance coming in the future. So hopefully that'll be helpful to you. Any questions about Okay, well, if you have any questions, you can contact me and I can try to help you as best I can. I'm not a statistician, so if you want me to put in results, I'm not, I'm not the person for the job. I can get you an account.
Now I'm going to talk to you about um, good clinical practice training and some of the changes that have uh, taken place recently in the training requirements. So I want to go over just briefly a little background on what GTP um, guidelines are, <clears throat> um, why are they important, and then talk about the new NIH policy on GCP training and what GCP training requirements are for Penn State University researchers and what the GCP training courses are accepted by um, Penn State. So first, a little bit of background. Um, what is good clinical practice? Why do we need to know this? Basically, it's an international ethical and scientific standard for design, conduct, performance, monitoring, auditing, reporting, analysis, and reporting of clinical trials. That's the standard definition for GCP. It was, the guidelines were developed in 1996 by the International Conference on Harmonization, and they provide a unified standard to facilitate mutual acceptance of clinical data by regulatory authority. So basically, they were developed um, to streamline the process for developing new drugs and devices. But as you'll see, these standards, these guidelines can be used for other types of research, um, not just uh, research clinical trials using uh, drugs and devices. Um, the guidelines uh, were uh, endorsed by the Food and Drug Administration in 1997 as guidance. Other countries have adopted them as regulations. So there is a little difference uh, in how we deal with them in different countries. So what are the goals of GCP? First of all, it is mainly to protect the rights, safety, and welfare of humans participating in clinical trials. That is probably the main um, goal of GCP. Another goal is to assure that the data collected in these clinical trials is good quality data, it's reliable, and um, it is, you know, it's, it can be used to determine whether or not a drug or a device is safe and effective. It also provides standards and guidelines for the conduct of clinical research. So, those are really the goals of GCP. That's why we practice them. Um, and I would say the two main parts are the ethics parts and the quality data. So <clears throat> GCP, um, the actual document is uh, known as E6, Good Clinical Practice Consolidated Guidance. It consists of eight different parts, eight different chapters, they have a glossary of terms. Um, they have principles of ICP, ICH GCP, which there are 13 principles and they are based on the um, ethical guidelines of the Declaration of Helsinki. They have chapters on the institutional review boards or independent ethics committee as they're called in other countries. They have chapters on the investigator, the sponsor, clinical trial protocol, investigator brochure and other essential documents. So basically, in these chapters, they describe the responsibilities of these different parties and also the content of what needs to be in a protocol, what needs to be in a investigator brochure, what needs to be included in an informed consent form. So these principles, these GCP uh, principles are important because they help ensure um, the safety of human subjects that take part in clinical trials. And they make sure that the data collected from these trials is good quality data that can be used to determine um, whether a drug or device is approved. But these same principles can also be used um, for other clinical uh, trials with behavioral and social science interventions. Um, basically, because it, they're looking at the ethics, you know, making sure uh, subjects are protected, as well as making sure the data collected is good quality data. 
So because of this, NIH came out with a policy in September. And in this policy, all NIH funded investigators and staff who are involved in the conduct, oversight, or management of clinical trials should be trained in good clinical practice, consistent with the principles of the International Conference on Harmonization. This GCP training um, needs to be refreshed every three years. It's effective, uh, was effective January 1st of this year, and it implies it applies to all new and existing NIH clinical trials. So what are the uh, training requirements at Penn State? Well, University Park and Commonwealth locations, except Hershey, uh, all study team members as of January 1st who were involved in NIH funded um, study meeting the definition of a clinical trial as defined by NIH will be required to complete GCP training and it has to be refreshed every three years. Now at Penn State Hershey, um, we have already been requiring GCP training for any um, study team members conducting FDA regulated research. I'm not, I, don't, I can't even remember how many years ago that went into effect. But as of January 1st of this year, all study team members conducting non-exempt human research at Hershey campus must complete GCP training, not just um, clinical trials, but all human subjects research, non-exempt human subjects research. Um, so all study team members, so new submissions are required to have that GCP training. Any new study team member being added to an ongoing non-exempt study have to have a GCP training. And study team members on ongoing studies at the time of continuing review will have to have this GCP training. Um, the GCP training must be refreshed every three years to remain current. And for new studies, the researchers whose certification will be three years old within 30 days from the date of submission will be required to update it before we will approve that new study. For um, study team members on ongoing studies, uh, researchers whose certification has or will expire as of the IRB expiration date uh, will be required to update their um, training. So what GCP training courses are accepted? Um, I'm going to break them down into two groups. One group um, is the GCP courses that are automatically uh, recorded in CATS. Um, <clears throat> right now, there's only one. It's the CITI GCP um, training that for investigational drugs and devices. So if you go in and take that course, um, CATS automatically receives notification that you've completed it and it goes into our system. Now, coming in 2017, they told us May of 2017, there will be a new CITI uh, GCP course that is for um, researchers who are conducting social and behavioral research. And as soon as that becomes available, we will also be accepting that. And that will automatically be reported in CAPS. Now, the other courses that I'm going to talk about are ones that are not automatically uh, reported in CAPS. And for these, um, the researchers will have to send their completion certification to um, the IRB office so that we can record um, the completion in our in our system. And I have the email addresses located there. It's irb-orp at psu.edu or irb.hspo, not dot, hyphen hspo at psu.edu. So these are the courses um, that we also accept. There's the Association of Clinical Research Professionals GCP course, the ACRP GCP course, um, that um, we will accept. In order to use this course, you'll have to um, get a user ID by contacting Elizabeth Galgosi in um, the uh, Research Quality Assurance Office. I have her email address there if you're interested in doing that particular GCP training course. 
Also, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease has a GCP course, and it is, I have the link there um, for that particular course. And finally, the Clinical Trials Network has a GCP course. Um, also, the link is available there. Um, both, all of these courses are sort of oriented towards uh, clinical trials that involve investigational drugs and devices. We do have a new training GCP course for social and behavioral research. It was developed by the National Clinical and Translational Science Awards Program. It's called GCP Training for Social and Behavioral Research. It applies um, the GCP principles to this type of research. It has nine modules. I listed them there for you. It is available now on the Penn State <laughs> Learning Resources Network at lrn.psu.edu. You would have to search for GCP and it would come up. And this is available to faculty um, as well as staff, employees of Penn State University. For those researchers, for instance, students that are not employees of the institution, you can access this um, behavioral, um, social behavioral research GCP course at, through the Society of Behavioral Medicine website. And I provide you um, a link for that website. Again, this course is not directly linked to our CATS IRB system, so you would have to um, print out um, or send us a completion report to our, the IRB offices, and we will then load the information into CATS IRB. So, are there any questions? If you have um, an investigator who has GCP training for this behavioral, one of the behavior mod modules, and then they go through submitting a study that's actually an FDA regulated a trial. Are you going to make them go through the GCP or the FDA? That is the plan, but it's a little difficult with the CAT system because it, when we look at the view training on our system, it doesn't tell us which course was completed, it just says GCP training. So, um, unless we run into problems. I, you know, we probably will not accept any GCP training. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you.